What's the first thing that comes to mind when someone asks you to describe yourself? For me, it's animal lover and Bible teacher. Maybe for you, it's busy mom and wife. I can relate to those too. Now, maybe it's what you do, teacher, graphic designer, nurse. I mean, the list could go on. Or or maybe you think of your personality, introverted, also me. (laughs) Or maybe when you describe yourself, you think fruitful. Welcome to Revive Our Hearts Weekend. I'm Dana Gresh, and today we're going to talk about fruitfulness once again. And we'll eventually get to two things that I don't think are associated often enough, singleness and fruitfulness. Now, if you're not single, I can almost hear you reaching to turn off this program, but wait, because you're going to want to hear today's episode. I firmly believe that those of us who are married need to reorient and reframe the way we think about singleness. It's imperative if we want to create a place in the body of Christ for our single sisters to thrive. And I need somebody in the back row to say amen. Will you help me do that today? Today's episode is for everybody. You know, our vision at Revive Our Hearts is to call women to freedom, fullness, and fruitfulness in Christ. And we don't add unless you're single. Still, some people take the fruitfulness to mean, you know, Genesis 128, be fruitful and multiply fruitfulness. But fruitfulness means so much more than just having biological children. Fruitfulness is a sign of life. I mean, think about this. It's what the gardener or farmer expects when he plants a seed, when he grows a vineyard. His expectation is that the garden will be fruitful, that he will harvest fruits. Now, in a biblical sense, That fruit looks like lives you lead to Christ, hearts you nurture and grow in Christ, and people you walk through hard times. Gretchen Saffles talked with Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth and me about that topic, and wow, it was so good. I wanted you to hear it. Gretchen, who leads a ministry called Well-Watered Women, explained how crucial it is to soak in God's Word if you want to be fruitful. Let's listen. Believing His Word is different than just knowing His Word, because Mm -hmm. we can know a lot of God's Word. We can actually know a lot of facts just in things in the world. For instance, my boys, I read a lot of books to them, and I read about pigs that can fly in books, (laughs) but I don't believe Mm -hmm. I'm going to walk outside or look outside my window right now and see a pig flying by. No, believing His Word is implementing it. It is allowing it to become our very heartbeat when um, trials come our way, suffering, when anxiety comes, that instead of responding with our flesh, we respond with God's word that never changes, but it always changes us. Christ in this Hmm. passage, he calls us to believe what he says. And he says later Hmm. in John chapter 15, he says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done to you. That's verse seven. So Christ is saying that when his word abides in us and we are believing that word, it's going to transform our actions. It's going to transform our Mm -hmm. thoughts and our feelings and everything about who we are. But believing is the next step. Believing is living a life of faith not just living a life of head knowledge, but that head knowledge moving down to our heart and becoming our actions in everyday life. And I think that's a battle. Uh, Absolutely. I I think for me to believe His Word, sometimes I have to remind myself that His capital T truth trumps the little t truth or facts that are happening in my world around me. When all the little facts seem so overwhelming yeah. and scary. Yes. I have to go to God's Word and transform my mind with His truth and sometimes say it out loud. Okay, this is the little fact that's happening in my world, but God is still in control. Yes. This is the little fact, but His grace is sufficient. This is the little fact, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yes. And I, I just want to, I guess I want to say it's not easy to believe His Word all the time. Yeah. Sometimes you have to preach to yourself. Absolutely. And that capital T truth is what sustains us. Just like a plant, mm. it abides, it has to stay right where it's rooted, and it receives water, it receives sunlight. This is a receiving that a plant has to do in order to flourish. 
And as believers, Mm -hmm. we receive his word. We read his word. Mm -hmm. We listen to his word. And like you said, Dana, we preach God's word to our hearts, especially in those moments where maybe those little T truths or those facts seem so much louder. Ultimately, it's God's capital T truth that we build our lives upon. And I think it's important to remember that this isn't just positive self-talk. Right. We're not just trying to make ourselves feel better about ourselves or about our circumstances. This is God's divine truth from outside of us, objective truth coming into us, the truth about the gospel, the truth about the character of God, the truth about how time is short and eternity is long, the truth about the grace and mercy and forgiveness of God. It's taking that truth, bringing it into our minds and our souls, and letting it overcome and overwhelm and transform everything that in the core of our being shouts against it. So the truth changes us. It renews our minds till we're thinking differently. So it's not just, oh yeah, you need to you need to think happy thoughts. Mm-hmm. This is, and I don't mean to make fun of positive thinking. I'm just saying we need God's thinking, yes, His Word, to change the way we think about everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If we're going to yeah. abide in Christ and if we're going to be fruitful and well watered women. Hey, did you notice what Gretchen Saffel said? She said that when God's Word abides in you, it's going to transform you. And that means you can't be truly fruitful unless what you're doing is motivated by love for God and a desire to obey His Word. Now, maybe you're thinking, okay, Dana, that sounds great, but I still don't know what to do to be fruitful. I get it. Can I reiterate that the first place you should go for answers is to the Bible? Yeah, it won't let you down. But there are a few practical tips I hope you'll put into practice. Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth has a few of those. And here's where we start to pull together the words fruitful and single. You see, my friend Nancy, she was single for 57 years and abundantly fruitful through all of them. If you're single, I think this will encourage you in a special way. And if you're not, I think it'll serve as an important reminder about how we, as married women, can support single women in their quest to be fruitful. Nancy was single when she recorded this clip we're about to hear. Here she is. I choose as a single woman to function and serve within the body of Christ, to be a part of a community of faith. I choose to function and serve within the body of Christ to cultivate relationships within the family of God. If you're a daughter of God, He is your Father. That means we are sisters. That means we have brothers within that family. There are relationships within that family that are to be healthy and wholesome. And when we put ourselves within that body, within that community of faith, and we cultivate relationships there, there's a great deal of blessing and joy to be had. Now, I make this choice not for the motivation of being loved, but for the motivation of loving, of loving others. I'm not going to get plugged into the body of Christ so I can find some people to love me. That's the natural tendency. But my right and pure motive for getting plugged into the family of God, the body of Christ, is so that I can have greater opportunity to love others. The motive is not to be a taker, but to be a giver. Not to get blessed, but to be a blessing to others. Paul wrote to the uh, Corinthians in chapters 12 through 14 of 1 Corinthians about this whole matter of the body of Christ. And he said, you're a part of a body. Whether you realize it or not, whether you accept it and appreciate it or not, you're one part. You're not the whole body. And neither is the singles group in your church the whole body. We don't need just other singles. And I think we need to be careful as singles that we don't develop all our relationships with other singles. We need relationships with the whole body of Christ, with children, with elderly people, with married people. We need relationships through all the body of Christ. They are different parts. They have different gifts. And Paul says, you need them and they need you. 
We need to be working consciously and intentionally at becoming a part of each other's lives. One of the things that has been a huge blessing to me in single life and ministry, with all of its ups and downs, has been learning to relate to families and looking for opportunities to get plugged in to other people's families. Now, this does several things. First of all, it has helped me to be more realistic in my notions about marriage and family. Because if you just hang around with other singles all the time, it's easy to fantasize about marriage and family and to think that it's all always wonderful. And you get around other families once you really get to know them and you find out, as we know intellectually, but you find out for real, it's not all always wonderful. And you get around people with pride and issues and struggles and frustrations and, and you just see real life. But getting around families has provided me with a great opportunity to love and to serve and to bless others, to be a part of a body. And as I bless others, as I give into those families, as I look for opportunities to minister to them and to meet their needs, I find that I get my needs met. Not because that was what I was seeking, but because when you bless others, you will get blessed. Jesus said, give, and it will be given unto you. And you'll get more back than you ever dreamed of giving out. I think this is one of the biggest antidotes to loneliness. Now, I have to say it's not a cure for loneliness because all people struggle with loneliness at times. God made us with homesick hearts that will never be totally full and totally at home until we're in His presence in heaven. So single people get lonely, married people get lonely, women get lonely. I suppose men probably get lonely in their own ways. I don't know quite how they express that. But this is something that is common to the human condition here on this earth. But I find that that loneliness is relieved a lot when I get plugged into other families. Now, I've heard singles say, and I have experienced it some myself, families just don't reach out. They don't include singles. They treat me like I'm something strange or weird. They just don't seem to know how to incorporate us. And I would say that is sometimes true. But I found that it's usually not intentional. It's usually just overlooking on the part of married people. And let me say to those of you who are married, I would encourage you to be intentional about reaching out to those who are singles. It's easier for you to add a place at your table when you've got, you know, several at your table already, to add one more than it is for the single person to have the whole family over to their place. Now, singles, don't be afraid to do that. I'm telling you, I have learned creative ways to be hospitable in the most unbelievable circumstances. I lived in hotel rooms traveling around the country for eight years, and I found ways to be hospitable in hotel rooms or in restaurants. But don't be afraid as a single if others don't reach out to reach out to them. They probably just don't understand how meaningful that can be. And if they feel awkward about it, they will feel less so once you start to relax and include them in your life. Get involved with your children. I have adopted children and now grandchildren, because my friends have started, their children have had children in some cases, uh, but adopted children and nieces and nephews of various sorts all across the country. There are children that I invested in years ago, going to their ball games, taking them out on dates, taking them shopping with me, uh, doing different things, plugging into their... I have sat through piano recitals and all sorts of things with kids who aren't my kids. But in order to be an encouragement to those families, what has happened next is that some of those kids, as they've become teenagers and older, they know they've got a friend. And some of those kids have opened up when they've been going through stretching times in their relationship with their parents or with the Lord. They've opened up their hearts, and I've been able to be an encouragement and a blessing to many of those kids in a way that supplements the direction their parents are giving Sometimes when the kids are having a hard time hearing it from their own parents. That's how we're part of a body. Sometimes I have greater freedom financially than somebody who's got six kids. 
I remember years ago, 20 or more years ago, some friends whose children were getting ready to start school. The parents were not sure about this matter of Christian education, if that would be a good thing for their family. And I believed so strongly then as I do now that this could be a great blessing. And God gave me the direction at that time to invest financially in helping those people put their children into Christian school during those early years of their lives. Those children have now graduated from college. One is married, and they are uh, walking with the Lord, and those parents have come back and said, thank you, thank you, thank you for plugging into our lives, getting involved, giving of yourself at a time when you could have just kept it for yourself, but you plugged into the body. You plugged into a family. They're elderly people who need someone to listen. I went the other day to visit an elderly couple in my neighborhood. They needed encouragement. They needed someone to listen to them. And I didn't really do anything except provide an ear, but I was plugging into other people's lives. And I came away feeling, I am so blessed. I was so encouraged. Give, and it will be given unto you. As you choose to function and serve within the body of Christ to cultivate relationships within the body of Christ, you'll find that not only are you giving, not only are you being blessed, but you're receiving. And you will be a recipient of blessings that God sends to you as a result. Amen. That was my friend Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth. You know what I took away from that? One, single women have to be intentional about relationships. And married ladies... What if we were intentional about being sensitive to that need for relationship our single sisters have? Here's the second thing I see. Serve. If you're thinking about others instead of yourself and doing it for God's glory, you'll end up being fruitful. Of course, living that out is the hard part. But single and fruitful. I love that. I love those words together. And I want you to hear from someone who has lived out these principles Nancy taught on in an amazing way. Jill Miller works at our ministry headquarters in Michigan, but not in the way you might expect. Let's listen to her story. My name is Jill Miller. I'm in my early 60s. I'm originally from Lebanon, Pennsylvania, but most recently um, lived in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. I guess I'll start with, you know, a real desire when I first started working full time to be able to have more time for volunteering in ministry. It just felt like working full time took too much time and effort and I and I couldn't serve like I wanted to. And I even prayed and said, God, you know, am I not supposed to be in corporate America? Because I mean, I was truly in the midst of, you know, high rise office building and the whole nine yards in the middle of Dallas, Texas. And he's like, nope, you're where I want you to be. And I'm like, okay, well, how about can I just save money and then retire early? And it was these answers, well, yes and no. Yes, you can save money, but you can't save it all for yourself. You need to be um, lavishly generous. And uh, so I did that. I followed that path basically for, you know, 30 plus years. And he is the one who grew my my finances to the point where he allowed me to to retire early. And so I was like, wow, thank you. How do I follow through with my, I don't want to say my vow, my commitment. How do I follow through on my plan? And so I started volunteering in all kinds of different places, an hour here, two hours there. And, and one of those that came across my pathway was the Reviver Hearts Ambassador Program. So I really felt God leading me that direction. And so I ultimately became a Reviver Hearts ambassador and served in um, central Pennsylvania for, I don't know, a year or so. And and part of that then, and again, there's a longer story to this, but ultimately God orchestrated things for me to volunteer in the office in Reviver Hearts using uh, skills that I learned during that 30-year period of working in data analysis and things like that. And I was like, oh, this will be fun. You know, do you think um, that maybe I could come back annually when I come out for Ambassador Summit. And they laughed and said, well, we could use you full time. And I was like, oh, okay. So that was the first seed that, you know, really got my mind thinking in that direction. My God, are are you asking me to be more involved in this? And um, ultimately, it was like, not only do I want you to be more involved, but I want you to move to Michigan um, to a little town called Niles that is in the middle of nowhere. Um, And I was like, Oh, okay. So basically, I, you know, uprooted myself, left my family, friends, house that I've lived in for 30 years, and moved to Niles, Michigan uh, to work in the office.
Yeah, sometimes people look at fruitfulness as raising children. And while that is true, it's not the only end game, if you will. Um, being fruitful can be spiritual children. Um, where you have invested in in kids, um, and and so for instance, right now I can say you know I teach Sunday school uh, third to fifth grade. That's investing in kids that may you may not see fruit from <laughs> for years uh, to come, and so you're investing in other people's lives, um, investing finances. Again, uh, you can can. A harvest can be reaped because you have sown seed, you've watered seed, you have fertilized. I mean, and go in that to that agricultural analogy. Um, there are so many steps in that. Um, God is certainly the one that provides the sunshine and the actual growth, but he uses us to be part of that process. And so our fruitfulness often comes in ways we may not even see. Sometimes, you know, we don't even see the harvest. We only get the plant. And we never know, uh, may never know until heaven, uh, how much our um, investment in people and in ministry has, has benefited others. There's all kinds of ministry opportunities, not just Revive Our Hearts. Um, local ministries like a pregnancy center um, serve on the board of directors there and involved in volunteering in certain things like that that helps one whole segment of people um, that you may never even see in a church building. Um, ministering to women or being a women's ministry leader at uh, a local church, um, investing in the ladies in in the church, coming alongside of them um, in in need uh, with with it could be meals with them in the hospital, it could be just encouragement, um, could be teaching um, and and helping them grow. Just listing off some of the things that that have crossed my path in the in the recent past, and one on one relationships can really do a lot as well. And also, I have to to say too that you know ministry to those who are not believers who are not in the church. Um, I make a specific attempt to interact with those I see regularly, um, at, like at the gym or something like that, that are outside of, of church or the ministry, um, and just try to be a light and an encourager from a, a spiritual perspective. Um, and sometimes that really doesn't seem very fruitful, and yet I don't know what God is doing, what seeds are planted in, in those areas as well. Using time uh, for ministry, volunteering, whatever you want to call it, is an investment in other people, in ministry, and you probably won't see the end result. And you may only play what appears to be a small part, and yet it's a piece of the tapestry. It is valuable not only to the ministry or to the person, individual who you're ministering to, but there's a spiritual component. Uh, it may not just be giving of your money, but it could be time. It could be making food. It could be doing anything like that that is reaching out, helping another person. That can be joyful. Um, if it's not joyful, uh, if you are really struggling in, in whatever you're trying to do, it, it's probably either you're trying to do it in your own strength, you weren't supposed to do it, or you're, you've got misplaced something or other, because giving is truly joyful. It is a sense of satisfaction, a meaningful purpose in life to, to give to others, and it's a great thing. And if that's not the motivation or the, the feeling um, that you get from doing it, that would back off. Is it the right thing? Am I not supposed to be doing that now? Should I be doing that? Or is it a heart check uh, for wrong motives out of pressure from peers, ministry leaders, or, or whatever? Um, but uh, volunteering, giving, uh, ministry opportunities are, are should be joy-producing, and that's a good test. Oh, I love Jill Miller, and I think of her as a friend. She has been intentional and focused on others, sacrificial and fruitful in her singleness. You know, these principles of fruitfulness are all true, whether you're single or married, but it sure was fun to focus on our single sisters today. I want to go back to where we started today. Fruitfulness is a sign of life, life that starts in God's Word. Not just being in it, but, well, someone says delighting in it. I can't think of a better time to delight in God's Word than this time of year as we celebrate the birth of Jesus. You know, a lot of us have live Christmas trees in our house right now, and they've been cut off from their roots, which means we can water them all we want, but eventually they're going to wither. But you, you, my friend, you need never wither. Not if you choose to position yourself to delight in God's Word. If you do that, 
Psalm 1-3 promises, you will become like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. If today's program was helpful for you, can I suggest sharing it with someone you know who might be blessed by it? And if you'd like even more women to hear programs like this one, would you consider giving toward the year-end needs of Revive Our Hearts? It's people like you who choose to give, who make it possible for us to keep telling women all around the world that they can be fruitful in Christ, fruitful in every season of life. And this month, when you donate, your gift will be doubled dollar for dollar. So again, would you pray and ask the Lord if He would have you contribute? You can give a gift by calling 1-800-569-5959. That's 1-800-569-5959. Or go to reviveourhearts.com slash weekend and click on today's episode. Next week, we're going to keep talking about fruitfulness. Come back to hear how you can experience that in yet another challenging season of life, motherhood. Thanks for listening today. I'm Dana Gresh. We'll see you next time for Revive Our Hearts Weekend. Revive Our Hearts Weekend, calling you to freedom, fullness, and fruitfulness in Christ.